The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 10161 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on artificial intelligence. <laughs> Nothing personal, Mr Gibson. <laughs> Future prosperity, a threat to employment or is it existential threat? And the debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And would those members who wish to speak please press the request to speak buttons? And I call Ke Kenneth Gibson to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And firstly, I wish to thank colleagues who took the time to sign my motion, particularly Gordon Lindhurst and Tavi Scott, as without their cross-party support, this debate could not have taken place. I also thank Mark Dames, Head of Public Affairs BT Scotland, and his colleague, Dr Andrew Starkey, and Heriot Watt University for their excellent briefings. Just four weeks ago, the world lost Stephen Hawking, one of our most inspiring and high-profile scientists, as someone who relied upon automation and artificial intelligence to allow him to continue leading his incredible life far beyond the two-year prognosis given in 1963, Mr Hawking was also one of the loudest voices warning against the dangers posed by the future relationship uh, between humanity and AI. Speaking in 2014, he went so far as to say, and I quote, the development of artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. He was not alone in expressing such concerns. Tesla car maker and space pioneer Elon Musk suggested AI is as big a threat to humanity as climate change or nuclear war. Sundar Pincher, chief executive of Google, said the impact of artificial intelligence will be more profound than electricity or fire. While some prefer to consign AI to the fringes of science fiction and simply ignore the inevitable universal adoption of automation, I believe it presents perhaps the biggest challenge society will face in our lifetime. It is therefore disappointing that the Scottish Government itself has not brought forward a debate to the Chamber on this topic. Of course, the, ap the apocalyptic notion that computers with superior intellects will eventually go rogue and turn against us is, I am assured by AI engineers, highly unlikely, with technical limitations holding back the ability of computers to process the same volume of information as our brains do these on a daily basis. Even mine, presiding officer. Although they have potential for evolutionary exponential growth, they may think in completely different and more peaceful ways than humans who have survived and evolved through millennia of war, famine and disease. What we must prepare for is the rapid acceleration of the three main technological trends that will impact Scotland's economy. Firstly, the rapidly increasing and diversifying capabilities of machines and data-driven decision-making. Secondly, the departure from traditional business models with new startups trending towards asset light digital platform-based business. And thirdly, global connectivity enabling collaboration in decentralized online communities. These dramatically shift the standard relationship between humans and machines, substantially reducing the involvement of workers in everyday business processes and customer transactions. While this may be good news for businesses benefiting from streamlined processes, Fears are mounting that AI technology will destroy jobs and indeed entire industries faster than it creates them, creating mass unemployment and handing market control to a handful of dominant firms quick to harness the new technology. The current wave of technological change is so far reaching it has been described as the fourth industrial revolution and an excellent report published by the Scottish Council for Development Industry in collaboration with BT Scotland entitled Automatic for the People. Of course, each preceding industrial revolution has produced winners and losers, but the distinction here is that the influence and effects of AI and machine learning technology will be ubiquitous. Transformational over a few short years and not reserved to a few sectors. Unless we radically reassess our workforce, particularly those in the most vulnerable jobs, we risk considerable social dislocation. As the motion highlights, the recent report by the Centre for Cities suggests that as many as 230,000 Scottish jobs could be lost in our four biggest cities over the next decade. However, according to the SCDI and BT report I referenced earlier, as many as 837,290 jobs are at high risk of being lost to automation, from 8% in education to 44% in retail and 63% in water supply, the latter alone meaning 10,642 fewer jobs. High-skilled private sector occupations are expected to increase while lower-skilled, more routine activities shrink. We're not just talking about the future. Businesses of all types already use AI to forecast demand, hire staff and provide customer services. In 2017 alone, companies globally spent £15 billion in AI-related mergers and acquisitions, over 26 times more than in 2015, demonstrating the momentum AI now has. 
The McKinsey Global Institute estimates that applying AI technology in marketing, sales and supply chain departments could be worth $2 trillion in profits and savings over the next 20 years. In financial services, AI already shapes new processes and financial controls, regularly reporting applicant checks and referencing data, eliminating human error on critical financial reporting. In healthcare, AI can eliminate subjectivity in patient diagnosis and use algorithms to connect symptoms and test results, delivering more accurate prognosis. Its uses also range from detecting criminal activity to identifying web material designed to radicalise Facebook or YouTube users. AI could transform the workplace and give employers unprecedented control over staff. From Amazon-style wristbands, which track the efficiency of warehouse staff, to smart ID badges, which track interaction between employees, data will be harvested and used in ways we may not yet conceive. Big Brother could be watching you. Yes, indeed. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I mean, some of it does seem a little bit gloomy on the jobs front, but, I mean, would you also accept that, say, in hospitality, in the coffee uh, shops, that there's a lot of people, you know, they want to be served by a person, and that makes a real difference? Kenneth Gibson. That, sorry, yes, I would certainly hope that human interaction remains at the forefront. I mean, I'm one of these people who never uses a machine at Tesco or Asda, for example. I always prefer to be served by a shop worker. But the trend is quite simple, straightforward and heading in one direction. So the position is that we have to adapt to our economy and, and look at the fact that the people who own these coffee shops may agree that indeed some people will, will want to be served by a human. Others will be looking at the bottom line uh, of course, it seems reasonable that AI could be used to screen for anomalies or flag up differences in pay between genders and races, which conscious or unconscious bias could cause a human to overlook. Yet, as the Cambridge Analytica saga demonstrated, data is a valuable asset and our laws are not yet fit to protect workers from automated surveillance, which goes beyond the consent baked into employment contracts. I'm not here to provoke alarm or theorise about the end of days, but rather to encourage the Scottish Government to join with other governments which, in collaboration with industry and civil society, already set out their AI and automation strategies. Indeed, the programme for government states an intention to transform Scotland into a nation which will lead in AI, machine learning, data analytics and low-carbon energy. Nevertheless, I doubt AI is currently being given the high priority required. Germany already has a 10 to 15 year strategy to advance the adoption of new digital technologies across industry and federal departments are exploring aspects of AI, including the ethics of self-driving cars, raised in Ivan McKee's members debate, the impact on the workplace and the use of drone technology. France commissioned a national AI strategy while Estonia is exploring the use of automation in healthcare, finance and other sectors. With some of the world's leading research universities here in Scotland, notably Harriet Watt, already undertaking cutting-edge work in a plethora of data-intensive businesses that choose to set up in their cities. I'm confident with the right strategy and outlook, Scotland can make the most of the opportunities afforded by these innovations. The Fraser Valder Institute has already advised that much of the research undertaken into potential impacts of technological change on Scotland has used UK-wide data and applied it uh, to Scottish, uh, Scotland's unique industrial structure. To miraculously predict and plan for technological transformation, the Scottish Government should lead the way in researching what tasks and activities will be impacted by automation and the distinct impact this will have on Scotland's businesses and workers. With careful planning and proper regulation, technological change will create growth and help businesses grapple with a shrinking working age population and weak productivity growth. According to PwC report, the economic impact of artificial intelligence in the UK economy, published last June, the impact of AI across Scotland's economy could boost annual GDP by 16.7 billion by 2030 through developing new industries. Presiding officer, while I've talked at length about technology, what really matters is Scotland's people. It's critical education training equips not just our young people, but the 80% of Scotland's current workforce will still be of working age by 2030, with the skills necessary to adapt to upcoming technological changes. There is consensus that the principles and design of Curriculum for Excellence are right for the opportunities and challenges of life and work in the 21st century, but there's more we can do to better prepare our workforce and the economy of the future. We're all familiar with the stereotype of the worker edging closer to retirement who suddenly finds there's no market for their skills and who's unable to adapt to new technology. Yet in this digital era, people could face this prospect far earlier in their careers. The Scottish Government must foster a culture where lifelong on-the-job learning is not just an optional extra, extra, but an inherent feature of working life. I'm sure everyone has their own vision of Scotland's future. What we must all surely agree on is that artificial intelligence is an issue of global significance that cannot be ignored. In the words of Andrew Carter, Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities, the time to act is now. 
We move to the open debate. Um, speeches are around four minutes, please. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Tom Arthur. <coughs> Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I didn't realise the words Big Brother may be watching you were the cue for John Mason to make an intervention, so I'll not uh, use them. <laughs> uh, I see he's leaving the chamber at this point anyway. <clears throat> so let me, let me begin by thanking Kenneth Gibson for bringing this debate to Parliament. I signed his motion because I think it raises a number of important points about artificial intelligence or AI, and these points are worth reflecting on. As the convener of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, I can see that there are potentially huge and also positive implications for Scotland in the coming years. Other issues, as has already been highlighted, may need to be looked at more closely. And it is important, however, not to be alarmist about future developments. I think myself of the concerns when computers first became mainstream a number of years ago, not that long ago, and people were worried that everyone would be out of a job. Uh, what we soon learned at that stage anyway was that a digital copy had to be kept of everything and a hard copy, which meant that we had a, a double workload. Um, and we may be beyond that now in this uh, paperless parliament, but certainly at the beginning that's the way it was. New jobs were created by the computer industry and the resultant cyber world we are all now familiar with, whether we want to be or not. Research by Deloitte has found that while technology is estimated to cost 800,000 lower skilled jobs between 2001 and 2015, three and a half million higher skilled jobs have been created in their place as a result of technology. Nevertheless, we should not exaggerate the effects of AI a constituent wrote to me after I signed the motion to express concern about it, suggesting that it may be an, and I quote, exercise in futurism reminiscent of the predictions made in the 1960s that we would now be having holidays on the moon, end quote. So I don't think any of us have had a holiday on the moon, at least not yet today. Nevertheless, that constituent agreed that a debate on AI was well overdue in the Scottish Parliament. And in fact, their principal concern was that it should be an evidence-based one. And I, I would hope that we can all agree on that. For there are identified and legitimate concerns, such as social and economic implications of increased automation, use of obsolete data, protection of personal privacy, and inappropriate application of biases and prejudices established from real-world data transferred into automated systems without adjustment. So these are just a few of the things that are legitimate concerns about the advance of AI. Um, however, let us remember at the same time, as is noted in the motion, that the effects on productivity and resultant contribution in boosting the economy can be positive and can be immense. An increased productivity is something we could do with in Scotland with the lack of growth that we've seen over the past eight years. We can harness our advantage by the progress that we have made in Scotland already on the AI front, which can prove key to being at the forefront of the technology of the future. This was recognized in the UK government's industrial strategy that growing the artificial intelligence and data-driven economy is one of the four grand challenges that the UK can take advantage of. The autumn budget included £75 million on AI-related developments last year and £21 million for tech specialisms in the UK, including for a hub here in Edinburgh, a city with a very successful AI track record and indeed in this very chamber. Deputy Presiding Officer, let us recognise the benefits that AI brings at the same time as we remain live to the risks and difficulties it can also create. Call Tom Arthur to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to uh, begin by thanking my colleague Kenny Gibson for bringing this debate to Parliament. I, we a few weeks back debated um, driverless cars in the members' debate, sponsored by Ivan McKee, and it was a 
particularly interesting contribution that uh, Mr Gibson made in that, uh, referring to the trolley dilemma in regards to how would a, a driverless car decide how to interact in such a situation. Um, and that speaks to some of the problems and challenges it will have with um, AI moving forward, and it speaks to the profundity or profundity of, our, of um, attempting to understand the impacts it will have. But I think in terms of looking forward, it might be useful to perhaps to begin by looking back and situate um, what potentially could happen within the broader context of previous industrial revolutions. Uh, Mr Lyndhurst um, referred to the potential for alarmism um, and also potentially the, the overstating what could um, actually happen. So if we think about maybe the first industrial revolution with regards to the impact of steam and the railway, that is perhaps the most, one of the most profound changes that have happened since the agricultural revolution. Then if we think about synthetic chemicals, plastics, uh, synthetic dyes, for example, again profound. But one of the most profound inventions was the washing machine. It emancipated many, by large majority, women from domestic drudgery. And, and, and men too. <laughs> the microwave oven, the, the kitchen, plumbed water, sanitation. So these are the most profound impact. So if we're going to suggest that the fourth industrial revolution um, as a consequence of AI and automation will be equally as profound as that, then we have to really consider what we mean. Now, in, in terms of whether AI will have an impact upon that level, I think it possibly could. And, and the reason I do so is if we do reach a stage where machines can start to learn for themselves. And then there is that situation for exponential growth. It is, we are some who forecast that machines will pass the Turing test within our lifetime. And when that happens, that creates a, a range of considerations which um, do seem like science fiction, but could become very real. If a machine develops a capacity to think, potentially to feel, should that machine have rights? Should it have responsibilities? Should it have duties and obligations? These are some of the questions that we may face going forward, and the fact that they're even possible suggests how profound this impact could be. Now, I think, our, rather than these sort of speculative concerns, much attention has, of course, of course. Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you. Would the right to vote be one of the rights that you would have to consider in that scenario that you were postulating? The member? Tom Arthur. <laughs> it, it perhaps sound a bit so um, speculative to be almost um, farcical. But if we think of perhaps the roles that machines will have and, for example, law as potentially paralegals, the introduction of machines to generate automated responses for the civil service, as some jurisdictions are experimenting with, and indeed potentially could have a role um, in, in supporting politicians in doing their job representing their constituents. For example, a machine could potentially go and take on a, constituents to a piece of constituents to casework. Then there is um, significant implications for um, our democratic system and how we think about that, even before we get to a stage of genuine artificial intelligence. But the one point I, I wanted to pick up on, and it is, of course, speculative concerns aside, the most profound point, which is the supposed or potential threat to jobs. And I think a point that's been highlighted is, is a question of job displacement or job replacement. Um, and I want to welcome the uh, Scottish Government's latest publication on this, the technological change in the Scottish labour market, which I'm sure the Minister will refer to. And it takes a very balanced view. And certainly my experience on the uh, Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, when we have taken evidence, is that while there are people on the fringes who make predictions of either um, catastrophe or no difference at all. The general consensus seems to be actually as what has happened in previous industrial revolutions is new jobs will emerge. So just as we saw the decline of um, horses as a means of transportation um, and power, um, other jobs took the place, uh, the place. So I think that's potentially where we are going forward. But I think it's very important that we're cognizant about the opportunities and the risks going forward. And while it's speculative and in court, we have a duty as politicians to start putting these ideas into the public domain and making sure that the population at large is aware of them because there is an inevitability about it. And when it does happen it, and these changes do take effect, it's vital that we are prepared and most importantly, that the public are prepared as well. Thank you. Jackie Bailey, followed by Ivan McKee.
presiding officer, like others, can I thank Kenny Gibson for bringing this debate to Parliament. Um, for some strange reason, some of my colleagues, and indeed his, burst into laughter when I said the debate was on artificial intelligence by Kenny Gibson. Who knows why they would do that? I find that frankly shocking. But continuing in Tom Arthur's train of thought, you know, he was, he was struggling, I think, um, to talk about liberating women, he wanted to say, from the kitchen by the invention of the washing machine and plumbing and various things. Um, far be it for me to point out that you would liberate men too. Um, and far be it for me to say that perhaps artificial intelligence might liberate women from men completely. But there you go. There you go. That's a novelty for another time. Um, the Labour Party has, of course, long been committed to protecting workers' rights, ensuring high standards of working conditions, and creating the opportunity for organisations and businesses to thrive. Presiding officer, in the 21st century, you know, I've no doubt the world is changing, the economy is changing, um, work is changing, and these ongoing life-changing technological advances um, will actually change the face of work as we know it. So we are on the brink of the next industrial revolution. It would be foolish of us, I think, to approach such a fundamental change to our country's industrial landscape with anything less than the enthusiasm that previous progress was met with. Because the opportunity to innovate our sectors, to improve the experience of workers, to strengthen our position on the world stage through the lights of artificial intelligence should be embraced with open arms, whilst ensuring that there are precautions in place to minimise any negative impacts that may arise. So I think it's vital we seize this change. It's vital we maximise its potential benefits, but we need to stay in control. We should be shaping the way automation works for us rather than allowing artificial intelligence to shape us. That means working with the trade unions, it means working alongside employers to dictate how best artificial intelligence can fit into our economy to guarantee the most we can get um, of this progress as we can. So I think the changes that automation presents are certainly far greater than we previously thought and it will affect every part of our economy. However, presiding officer, I'm sure that Kenneth Gibson agrees with me that the current state of our economy leaves little room for complacency. This has been evidenced in the recent figures on the minimal growth Scotland's economy achieved in the last quarter. Now that would suggest that if we want to improve economic performance, which we all do in Scotland, we could drive a significant boost to our productivity and to our G GDP and automation could provide an opportunity to do just that. As Kenny Gibson has already highlighted, and I think it's worth repeating, PricewaterhouseCooper in June 2017 told us that the impact of AI across Scotland's economy could boost annual GDP by up to £16 billion. Pounds. Indeed. I'm very grateful for what you... <laughs> Sorry, I, I was waiting with bated breath to hear what you were going to say next, Mr Arthur. Sorry. Thank you. Tom Arthur. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I'd be interested to hear um, Jackie Bailey's view on the potential of a combination of the Internet of Things, big data and artificial intelligence for reviving the idea of a planned economy. Yeah. Jackie Bailey. Um, this is something that, because we, we do actually believe that planning is critically important in the economy. If you take some of our recent debates around about procurement, the opportunity to secure more of the supply chain in Scotland is something that I think is shared across the chamber. If we can use artificial intelligence and big data to achieve that even more, then I don't see what the problem with that is. I want us to get the maximum for our investment that we can, and if artificial in intelligence helps with that, then we should embrace it. Um, I want to see better conditions for workers. I want to see maximum productivity in our sectors. But we do know that industries such as transport, retail, administration, they're likely to diminish in size. But it's industries such as these which currently hold the majority of Britain's 900,000 zero hours contracts and Scotland's something like 75,000 zero hours contracts. And in many cases, they are low skilled and low wage jobs. Um, We've put a huge amount of time and effort in Labour to try and change the exploitative nature of these jobs. I would commend to the Chamber our industrial strategy, Tom Watson's Future of Work Commission, because 
In there are plans to ensure that workers will receive the retraining required to take full advantage of the high-skilled, high-wage jobs that often come hand-in-hand hand with automation. We are seeing new technology and telecoms industries emerge. An expected increase in Scotland in ICT and digital tech jobs from 84,000 to 150,000 by 2020. That's an increase of 11,000 new skilled jobs each and every year in that sector. But we have a challenge, a distinct lack of um, skilled young workers, and we need to train even more 16 to 24 year olds to meet that challenge. Presiding officer, I can see you waving at me. I think that artificial intelligence, um, despite the hilarity earlier on, does provide us with an opportunity to secure economic prosperity for future generations and to make artificial intelligence work for our economy. Thank you. Ivan McKee to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to thank uh, my colleague Kenny Gibson for bringing this very important subject to the uh, Chamber for debate uh, this evening. The subject of AI or artificial intelligence, um, although I'm not sure if Jackie Bailey had a different AI in mind during the earlier part of her speech. Um, as Kenny Gibson rightly said, it's one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges facing um, facing society and our economy at the moment. And it's a hugely broad subject. And I think there's two particular directions that we want to, to focus on. Uh, first of all, on the economic impact and how we manage that, and then say something briefly about the, the moral impact that's been, uh, been mentioned earlier. Um, the, the, the scale of the impact uh, in economic terms has been referenced by the, the, the reports that we've, that we've talked about, the City Impact Report, the PwC Report, the SCDI Automation Report. Uh, the PwC Report talks about a potential growth in the Scottish economy of 8.4% due to artificial intelligence by the year 2030, um, referencing the UK, which it thinks could grow by 10.3% due to the difference in the structure of the economies. And that's something uh, we, we need to bear in mind as we talk about how best to exploit the opportunities of artificial intelligence for the, uh, for the Scottish economy. As many members have said, we've, uh, we've kind of been here before, and I remember growing up in the 1970s and people talked about um, the changes that technology was going to make and then the early 80s with huge unemployment as a consequence. Um, but we, we came through that and new technologies, new jobs uh, took, up, uh, took up the slack. We don't still have uh, huge typing pools of, uh, or, 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 or people typing, their typing letters out. Um, been replaced by technology, we don't still have a million people working in coal mines, um, largely gone, replaced by, replaced by other jobs. So artificial intelligence and those technological developments have the huge potential to dramatically increase productivity, allow us to do a lot more, and as Kenny Gibson mentioned, for example, in healthcare, to do a lot more of better quality as a consequence. And I suppose the question then is what do we do as a society to, uh, to prepare to manage that, that best? And I think one of the things I would say is it's, it's about focusing not on the whole breadth of, the, of, of what might happen, but picking out a number of specific sectors where we can leverage the skills base we've got um, and put some investment and focus into that. Looking at the R&D strengths we've got, uh, working with academia, business, government, trade unions, third sector, to, uh, to identify, as I say, a handful of sectors that we're really going to invest and focus on to become world class at. Self-drive uh, uh, vehicles is something that I myself always have brought to the, the chamber in a debate, and I think that could be one of the sectors, and I think we need to identify another. Um, in business, one of the hardest things you need to do in terms of strategy is to anticipate when you need to move on from your very successful business model um, and build a completely different business model in anticipation of the future. Um, and that kind of disruptive technology, I think, is something we to embrace now before it's too late. How do we configure our education and skills um, system to be able to deal with that? And how do we create the attitude that life is not um, a job for life or even a career for life? It's constant reskilling into different jobs. Um, myself moving into the career of politics at the age of 50 is perhaps a, an example of that. Um, and as Jackie Bailey said, the important thing through all of that is staying in control and being able to manage those, uh, those impacts. Um, a brief word on the, the societal impact, clearly through the transition there's a lot of things are going to happen and it's going to be very difficult for individuals and their families and I think it's worth talking briefly at this stage about the role perhaps that um, a universal citizens basic income can, can perhaps play, the, play in that to smooth out that transition, give people um, a support network but also the confidence to be able to take risks and identify opportunities, start up businesses even if they're going to fail they know that there's a support network there and to be able to move from one career to another. Um, 
government without, uh, with, without hitting huge financial hardship as a consequence. I think that's something that has to figure very largely as a part of, uh, of where we're going with, uh, with AI. Um, and very briefly on the, the moral side of things, clearly the singularity concept is something that potentially is a bit scary when things go wrong. And Tom Arthur kind of entertainingly pointed out, should machines have uh, rights and responsibilities, perhaps something for discussion, who knows. Uh, in conclusion, Poseidon officer, I think there's an, uh, four or five things I'd like to ask the government to kind of uh, focus on and have a think about. Um, one, what are we doing to identify what specific sectors we should be focused on to take best advantage um, of, the, of the coming technological revolution? What are we doing in terms of education and skills to prepare ourselves for that? What are we doing to ensure the social transition um, is as smooth as possible? And I think that's where the, the citizens' income perhaps come in. Um, to start the debate on the moral aspects of that and perhaps to, uh, to pull together, as Kenny Gibson identified, an artificial intelligence strategy that allows us to, to move forward with, uh, with some confidence. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. The last two open debate speeches are Brian Whittle, followed by Claire Adamson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also congratulate Kenny Gibson for securing time in the Chamber to debate what I think uh, is, a, is a hugely interesting topic and I am delighted to be able to contribute because it gives us so much scope to what we can actually talk about. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, death, taxes and change, uh, the three guarantees in life. Of course, change is happening at such an increasing rate that uh, more and more we're having to adapt and change our skill set, as, as Agni Key has pointed out, just to stay in the job market or even keep up with life. And we humans are instinctively wary of change and tend to resist. But as all the Trekkies uh, around the room will know, resistance is futile. Um, technology has advanced uh, at such an incredible amount in my time. And I've mentioned this chamber before that I didn't have a mobile phone until I was in my 30s. And I remember black and white television with three channels. When you actually had to get off the sofa to change the channel. Can you imagine that, Deputy Presiding Officer? I mean, we uh, were on a technological highway and moving at such a speed that it's increasingly difficult to keep up with. And I've always been mentioned, uh, interested in this mythical uh, technological singularity, that predicted point in time where machines become smarter than human beings. And Ray Kurzweil, who's the, the, the Google's director of engineering, uh, of en uh, as well as that, that well-known futurist, predicts we'll hit this point within the next 30 years or so. In fact, he reckons around 2029. And we should take heed because of the 147 predictions he's made since 1990, he has an 86% accuracy. And he says the singularity will, and I quote, lead to computers having human intelligence or putting them inside of our brains, connecting them to the cloud, expanding who we are. Today, that's not just a future scenario. It's here in part, and it's going to accelerate, back to my reference of seven of nine and Vorg. Uh, we, we all have to accept that it's coming sooner or later, but of course, the question is, should we fear the singularity? Everyone knows, of course, that when machines become smarter than humans, they tend to take over the world, uh, matrix style, uh, right? But uh, many of the world's science and technology leaders, as, as Kenny Gibson has alluded to, like the late Steve, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and even Bill Gates, warn us about this kind of future, and it certainly helps to keep the world's sci-fi film studios busy, and in turn keeps us royally entertained. Kurzweil will suggest that the singularity, at which point a single brilliant AI enslaves humanity, is just fiction. And I would like to suggest that AI offers us opportunity. You may consider that this futuristic cybernetic society is more of a, fancy, a fantasy than a glimpse into the future. However, there are people with their com computers in their brains today. Parkinson's patients, an example of cybernetics getting a foothold and perhaps in the future of technology will be invented that can go inside your brain and help your memory with the implications for dementia sufferers, for example. So perhaps the, the vision of machines taking over the world at the point of the singularity should be replaced with a future of human machine synthesis. Now that opens up whole new worlds, literally, space exploration. How do we as a species, with our frail bodies and mind, travel the vast distances required to continue our thirst for knowledge and our need to consume resource across the galaxy. Currently, we could not survive the journeys in space to explore other parts of the solar system, let alone the stars beyond. AI is still the most feasible option science has come up with, perhaps even downloading our own consciousness into machines. Currently, a Mars rover continues to send back uh, information from the surface of Mars, and ultimately, we do need to leave this planet 
the human race to survive. So perhaps we need to re rethink our definitions, definition of what, what constitutes a human being. As Kenny Gibson's motion suggests, we actually don't really know what's coming down the track. What we do need to, to do is ensure that Scotland is ready to take advantage of the opportunity that AI will undoubtedly bring. And we do have a great track record in developing new technologies uh, within Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, whatever our thoughts and fears uh, are, we can confidently say that AI is not so much of I'll be back, uh, more a case of it's here to stay, and we need to embrace the opportunities that it will bring. Deputy Presiding Officer. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you for letting me in this evening. I hadn't intended speaking this evening, but I, I was absolutely fascinated by the contributions in the chamber this evening. In the 1980s, I was studying um, for my computing degree, um, and it was quite an interesting degree. It was um, what is now Cal Glasgow Caledonian University, and although it was a science degree, we also studied psychology and business and accounting. And as part of our psychology course, we were asked to look into what the effect our industry might have on future generations, what impact it could have on working lives. And, um, uh, and that was put to us in the context of what was then the whopping just, um, uh, riots outside when it was moving from um, the manual printing process to digital printing process. And we saw, saw those um, uh, issues outside whopping and, and how the police reacted to that. And, 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 and it, was a, it was a real, really interesting lesson. But I remember reading, and I can't remember who wrote it, but an essay um, that talked about um, the human race as a whole and our psyche as a collective psyche and how we respond to technology. And, and the author had talked about Copernicus and his view about the um, moving from the earth being the centre of the universe to creating the sun as the centre of the universe, of course, proved years later with Foucault's pendulum that led to um, Galileo being um, excommunicated for the Catholic Church. So shocking were these thoughts that the human being wasn't the centre of the universe. And this person suggested that the the next stage that could have such a shocking effect on humans was the realisation when artificial intelligence came about that it would have the same effect on the human race because we would no longer be the sentient being in, in our universe. And, and it was absolutely fascinating to see that, especially in the context of, of what real technology was, hap was changing in our lives. And we talked about the Luddites and how they had approached um, uh, the technology in their time in, in destroying weaving machines because it was a threat to them, right up to the modern day um, and what was happening in, in our country at the moment. And it, it's, it's remained with me, that whole thought about how we approach technology. And if it's taught me anything is that, that, that the people who are standing um, against the advancement of technology and against it happening very, very rarely win. It's something we can't hold back. And the way to, to get an advantage from that is to be the leaders in it, to be the experts in it, and to be the people that lead in new technology and new uh, innovations. Um, and I want to, as someone who worked in IT, to be quite clear that a lot of what we've talked about um, is not AI today. It's what in, in my time as studying would have been called expert systems, which is taking the knowledge we have as humans, applying it um, to uh, a computing function of some kind and, and getting a result from that. But it wasn't, the computer wasn't doing anything other than replicating what had been told to it by humans. It was absolutely not an artificial intelligent, it, intelligence. It was just capturing data and using that data in, in a positive way or to, to, to achieve an outcome. It was um, health situations I was looking at where they were capturing information from medical people to, to arrive at a diagnosis based on what steps they would go through um, to actually achieve a diagnosis. And we, when we see the, the current opportunities in terms of census and the work that's been done there and sensor technology, again, that is all about capturing information, capturing our environment, capturing information and using that in a positive way. Um, but we don't have the real artificial intelligence yet. And that's something that I, th I think the, the warnings that have been there should be known and we should be very co cognizant of. So, um, so while we have the examples of Marvin the Paranoid Android and Holly from Red Dwarf right through to HAL 9000 who killed off his um, entire crew, the, I mean, the warnings and the concerns of us are there. And, and when we can look at the benign picture of Asimo, the Honda robot, which was very cute and 
um, looks very benign and non-threatening. We know that the technology in there can be used to weaponise, to be used in a, a, in a, a, in a, a, a military forum. So like all of these things, for me, the most important thing is we understand this technology, but we use it for the benefit of humanity. Thank you. Now call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate um, for around seven minutes, but the way it's gone, I would say, as long as you like, really. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, presiding officer. And I too would like to thank Kenneth Gibson for securing this motion and uh, welcome the contributions today from members across the chamber. Because regardless of which study it is we talk about, whether it's Centre for Cities or a BTS UDI one or PWC, they all, uh, we, which, whichever we rely upon for our estimates of the impacts within uh, society, the significance of the issue for our economy and Scotland's people, uh, our workforce, uh, cannot be overstated. So it is right um, that Kenneth Gibson has brought it today uh, to, the, to the chamber. Um, I take his point on board entirely about government time. I will put, play that back to my, my colleagues, but I want to reassure him and members across the chamber today that it is an issue that we take particularly seriously. The topic of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies has always interested me. I mean, a number of references to science fiction have been made today, but uh, I suppose uh, one, one film based on the book, Do uh, Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, uh, Blade Runner and its successor film uh, to get that in on the agenda today is one of my personal favourites but it does raise some ethical issues about how uh, robots and artificial intelligence can be used and that ties in very well with what Claire Adamson was just saying I think it's a very important point that cuts across all the speeches today is around it's not just about the development of technologies but whether that can be used to benefit mankind and, uh, and our planet rather than do it, uh, do it harm. But the topic uh, has been one which has uh, interested me, as I say, and it resonates strongly with the Scottish Government. It is, in short, an area where ever-increased attention is now being turned. Uh, Tom Arthur referred to the work that's been led by Jamie Hepburn in respect of the technological change in Scottish labour market, and that does tie into some of the points that Ivan McKee was making about what are we doing to look at the, the labour market and to uh, adjust an, an, a curriculum in, in our schools, our colleges, universities, to make sure our young people are prepared uh, for the world that uh, they will encounter. In March last year, my colleague Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, was asked to provide a welcoming speech at the European Robotics Forum. It was the first time for uh, the very prestigious event to be held in the UK. It attracted over 800 delegates, and this provided a valuable opportunity for policymakers and stakeholders to engage in this very subject. And for the organisation uh, organisers, sorry, to have chosen Edinburgh to hold the conference is a testament to Scotland's strength in computer science research and proof that our skills and expertise in this area has achieved recognition across Europe. Indeed, as I will touch on, uh, the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics is led from Edinburgh, as you understand by the name, by Heriot Watt University and University of Edinburgh. That's a UK-wide uh, collaborative body. And uh, Edinburgh University, for example, to reflect the point that Brian Whittle made, is, is involved with working with NASA on its uh, robots to be used, Valkyrie, to be used in the future missions to Mars. So we are very much at the cutting edge of this technology and we can be proud of that. But uh, as we can remember, K Kenneth Gibson has rightly challenged us to, to think about how that impacts on uh, the people of Scotland. So understandably, much of the focus has been on the impact on occupations and jobs. And uh, sometimes it's classified around uh, or, 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 or codified around referring to um, the loss of jobs or loss of employment, but it may also be replacing tasks with employment. So the jobs themselves may remain, but the way in which those jobs are done uh, may change fundamentally using technology to make uh, and assist um, that process, uh, make it easier. I certainly will. Tom Arthur. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I just wonder if he'd want to comment upon the metrics we use with regards to the economy, such as headline employment figures, GDP and productivity, because they often don't capture exploitative work, zero hours contracts and work that perhaps isn't very stimulating. And one of the thing, features that we are seeing is the hollowing out of middle scale jobs. And while there might be growth in high scale jobs, equally greater automation could see an increase in low skilled jobs. And does he agree with me that we need a superior set of metrics to understand what's happening so that we can direct this change to actually improve people's well-being and overall quality of life and not simply um, see an increase in GDP? Paul Wheelhouse. I, I certainly would. We, we obviously, as a government, have been looking increasingly with stakeholders around the use of uh, going beyond GDP, looking at alternative measures of the economic success of our society. Uh, I take the, the, the member's point entirely around uh, the, uh, the, the difficulties in picking out some of the issues around zero-hour contracts and other exploitative uh, contracts in, in those measurements. 
and, and obviously with AI that will make further complicate uh, matters in terms of understanding the, the impact on, on individuals and the ability to translate that into to wages as well in terms of wage growth. So it's certainly something we need to, to, to be mindful of. Um, but in terms of the, um, uh, the, the focus that we have had on jobs, emerging technologies such as AI do present opportunities for Scotland and Jackie Bailey is quite right to highlight that. Um, of course, we must acknowledge these opportunities do uh, come with a number of concerns, and to be fair, Jackie Bailey recognised that as well. It is part of human nature to have concerns where there is an unknown, and, but where there is an unknown, we can learn, of course, and uh, to learn is where Scotland does thrive as a nation. Uh, in fact, as I indicated earlier, our universities are considered world class and have history of excellence in fields such as data science, machine learning, and of course, artificial intelligence. And I take Claire Anderson's point that we need to be careful about how we describe artificial intelligence, and I, I uh, defer to her knowledge uh, as an IT specialist in terms of expert systems versus true artificial intelligence. But emerging technologies can uh, drive growth and productivity, a uh, point made by Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, as we move further into the modern day commercial environment, our industries are required to continuously adapt. Uh, and to, to pick up um, Ivan McKee's point about which sectors we're focusing, clearly manufacturing will be an area where we'll have to pay a lot of attention. Uh, but equally, there are service sectors such as financial services, where the growth of fintech we're already seeing is concerned to many members here in the loss of their branches across the country. That's partly a response to a move to technology and increasing that will engage more in artificial intelligence as we go forward. So these are all things which are happening now, here and now, and we're seeing in public sector opportunities in terms of healthcare, obviously, to improve patient experience and quality of life for those who have disabilities. And although Stephen Hawking's points were well made around the threats, clearly he did benefit from technology and we need to identify opportunities where we can improve quality of life for individuals. Uh, but uh, we, we need to uh, focus on uh, trying to, as, as we said earlier, uh, focus on where we can gain uh, for mankind. Um, by integrating processes such as automation, we can remain competitive in a global marketplace, and this is in particular is key to the future of our manufacturing base. A sector highlighted in a number of studies as one that will be strongly impacted on uh, by emerging technologies. And that's why the Scottish Government has committed £48 million to a National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland in Inchinen uh, to help accelerate innovation by enabling manufacturing companies to trial and test new processes, application and technologies. And we're also supporting uh, the development uh, through, through Manufacturing 4.0 service to help companies understand how emerging technologies can be integrated into their businesses effectively and, effic and efficiently. And that service will be uh, launched properly uh, very soon. Uh, the Institute will also, uh, the NMIS will also help uh, support our workforce by providing resources to develop and enhance the skills they have and their employers need, resulting in more competitive businesses while safeguarding jobs. And we're, we are a small nation, but we're proud to be vibrant, inclusive and an outward looking digital nation as well. And the Scottish Government has a vision for making the most of data to champion across Scotland a trustworthy use of this for public benefit. Delivering innovation using our skills in data science and artificial intelligence techniques is an important strand of us achieving that vision, and we're working to accelerate this through data-driven research. Scotland's refreshed digital strategy, realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world, was published in March last year, and it sets out plans for ensuring that we put digital at the heart of everything we do. And data innovation plays an important role within this strategy, and along with digital, will create an irresistible force to drive innovation in our public services. There is also the importance of transparency for this work to uh, be carried out under robust ethical and governance frameworks. And Kenneth Gibson, uh, Claire Adamson and others have made powerful remarks around the need for ethics. Uh, and Dee Dive and McKee's previous debate on autonomous driving touched on this as well. We're investing £300 million into the Edinburgh South East uh, Scotland city region, including £60 million towards innovation. And obviously there's investment from UK government as well, which we should acknowledge, which will help to secure a place as the data capital of Europe and to create an environment that will nurture and attract further innovation and investment to Scotland. Um, there's much I can say about cyber resilience. I'm conscious I've already overreached my time, presiding officer, uh, but this has been a valuable debate. And I know members on all sides are focused on ensuring that in Scotland, we take an ethical and informed approach when considering artificial intelligence. I note entirely the concerns that Mr. Gibson has raised today, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that as a chamber today, and that we are mindful of the impact on work, the workforce of Scotland, but I hope I've assured members that we're already taking steps to strike the correct balance when considering the needs of economic development against our uh, social and ethical values and the future will bring many opportunities and I hope we all agree that Scotland is well placed to be a global leader in the development of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.